Welcome to St. Michael's Uniting Church online gathering for the third Sunday of Easter. I'm Margaret Maiman, Minister at St. Michael's. Wherever you've come from, wherever you're going to, whatever you believe, whatever you do not believe, you're welcome here. At St. Michael's, we acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, traditional owners of the land on which our church stands. Today, I invite you to join with me in acknowledging other indigenous peoples on whose land the many people who are participating in this service live. We honor their elders past, present and emerging. And with them, we pray for justice for the people and for the land. Today, our Easter story takes us on a journey, a journey on the road to Emmaus, a journey in which despair is transformed into delight as the Christ is made known in the breaking of the bread. Today, as we tell the story of the risen one who greeted the beloved community with the words, peace be with you, we remember also another story that shapes our culture, bound up in the ritual remembering that is Anzac Day. It is my hope that being connected as people of spirit will sustain us in the uncertainty of the, this time of global pandemic. That joining together will move us beyond social distancing into spacious connection in which love and compassion are shared. In a world of many tears, we search each day for markers of hope, for small unexpected signs of light and love, for the assurance that goodness is planted more deeply than any wrong. That in the midst of all that is in our lives and in our world, Christ is risen.
come into a time of prayer, prayer of awareness and opening, opening ourselves to the power and the presence of the holy within us, among us, and beyond us. As part of my prayer, I will invite you to join with me in praying a paraphrase of the Lord's Prayer. So let us pray. God of love and peace, you travel with us, and in our traveling, we struggle to shed our fears. Our hearts have not yet re reached a trusting openness, and so often we fail to recognize your presence in the stranger in our midst. God of love and peace, in our utterly divided world, we have not always loved our neighbor as ourselves. We have not always lived as people of faith. And so let us take a time to reflect on what has been, to be still and to open ourselves to a new day. In Easter, we are reminded that the sacred invites us to be people of love, to walk not in fear, but in that trusting openness which comes as a gift to the human heart from the heart of the divine. And so, remembering Jesus, who showed us the way, we pray together God, you are life for us. Holy be your name. Your new day come. Your will be done on earth as in your vision. Give us this day our bread for the morrow. And forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Strengthen us in the time of test. And deliver us from evil for the power and the splendor and the fulfillment are yours, now and forever. Amen. It's customary in our worship to greet one another with a sign of peace. Though we cannot be physically together on this day, we still share peace with one another. So as I offer peace to you, I invite you to greet those who are with you if you are in the company of others, with a sign of peace, and if you are on your own, to extend your peace to those who you know who need your care, as we all seek peace for the world in which we live. May the peace of divine presence be with you. Amen.
Yesterday was Anzac Day, a day to grieve lives lost in war. It is a complex day, made more so this year by the limitations that the pandemic has placed on public gatherings. For some Australians and New Zealanders, Anzac Day has become a celebration of national identity. Questioning the development of this understanding is sometimes considered disrespectful or inappropriate, and yet it is important to ask questions out of respect for the dead and out of hope for a peaceful future. On the day after Anzac Day in the year 2020, in the context of Christian community, I remember with respect and grief those who died in that senseless, bloody battle, Turks and Anzacs, and all the bloody battles that took young lives since then. I think of my great uncle, Robert Hugh MacPhail, who was killed on the Western Front in France two months before the end of that terrible war. I remember conscientious objectors who for religious or philosophical reasons refused to fight, including Christian pacifists, people imprisoned or tortured by the state. I remember those whose return from war was marked by physical, mental, spiritual and emotional harm. I remember their experience and the enduring impact of war on families. I think about Brian, the man who lived on the steps of Pitt Street Church in 2016 for almost a year an army medic traumatized by the first Gulf War, an alcoholic veteran homeless on Anzac Day. Shirley Murray's hymn, Honor the Dead, captures with respect and sadness, and yet with hope, the complexities of our remembering on Anzac Day.
the Gospel. Listen for the words of faith in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, verses 13 to 35. Now on that same day, two of the disciples were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with, with each other about all the things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognising him. And he said to them, What are you discussing with, with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. One of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does, does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, What things? They replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that Jesus was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are! and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus interpreted to them the things in the scriptures that referred to the Messiah. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on, but they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us because it is almost evening and the day is nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognised Jesus who vanished from their sight. They said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, Christ is risen indeed and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how they had come to know Jesus in the breaking of the bread. For the stories of Jesus and the beloved community of friends, we give thanks. The contemporary reading is by Nicholas Lee and titled Christa of the Red Dress after Emmanuel Garibay's Emmaus. Christa of the low cut red dress with the bare arms, the fine boned olive features, of the laughing eyes, the open mouth, the long gesticulating arms. I want to sit with you for a long time like your companions do in their ordinary working clothes, eating and drinking in some corner of a favourite club where the lights are muted and the colours are warm. Everyone is talking at once, throwing back their heads and laughing, yet listening to each other too, eyes and hands eager to connect. It doesn't matter how or why you've returned to us, nor that no one knows who you are. It only matters that we are here now, caught up together in wild abandon in this unlikely inn of happiness. For the word that was in the beginning, for the word that invites and inspires, for the word embodied in us, we give thanks. In the name of the Spirit who accompanies us and invites us to life. The Emmaus story is as much a story of resurrection 
as the stories of the empty tomb. It's set on the same day. At dawn of that day, women at the tomb were told by angels that Jesus was risen. So they ran to tell others. The male disciples thought it was an idle tale, but the women refused to be quiet and the good news was made real. The good news of resurrection was made known. Now the dawn was long past. The day was nearly over. Two disciples were walking on the road to Emmaus, one who we've never heard of, Cleopas, and one who wasn't named at all. I suspect that the second disciple was probably Cleopas's wife, otherwise her name would have been written down. And I'm going to call her Mary, because it's a safe bet, there were lots of Marys. Seven miles from Jerusalem and late in the day, they told the stranger who joined them on the road all that had happened to Jesus, about his death and about his resurrected presence experienced by the women. They spoke of their experience of Jesus' life, Jesus as the prophet whom they hoped would save the nation. The stranger brought their experience into dialogue with the scriptures, interpreting what they had known. Stay with us, they urged the stranger. Stay with us because it is nearly evening and the day is almost over. So he went to stay with them. There are two aspects of the story that I want to reflect on today. One is recognition of the Christ especially our not seeing what we don't expect to see. And the second is the place of shared meals in our tradition and in our lives today. Jesus taught his followers in the parable of the last judgment that loving God meant caring for the sick, providing clothing and food and shelter for the poor visiting the imprisoned. Nothing could be clearer in the gospel than that this is what it is to be a Christ follower. Yet so often we fail to recognize the Christ in others. If we are going to survive the pandemic and its economic and social aftermath, we will need to recognize the sacred in all people and in all of life. And when the urge for self-interest, which is understandably strong, takes over, we will need stories that encourage us to move beyond self-interest, to love our neighbor, including our neighbor who is different. The artist Emmanuel Garibay has painted several Emmaus paintings in which the risen Christ is represented as a woman a woman with nail-scarred hands, who is made known to others at the table in a Philippine shanty town bar. Our contemporary reading by Nicholas Slee, author of Seeking the Risen Christa, is a poem in response to Garibay's art. Christa was first used in the 1980s by artists and sculptors who used images of a woman on the cross to draw attention to women's suffering through sexual and domestic violence. Two of the most famous sculptures of that time were titled Christa. Feminist theologians reflected on images of Christa crucified, but they also turned their attention to resurrection, asking where will we find the risen Christa? Garibay's Emmaus paintings amplify the gospel story of the Emmaus meal. Mary and Cleopas had not recognized Jesus. Garibay's paintings invite us to consider our failure to recognize the risen Christ, our failure to see resurrection in unexpected people and surprising places. In the painting, the disciples roar with laughter and delight 
when they realize that they have not seen what was right in front of their eyes all the time. The idea of the risen Christ being more than the resuscitated body of Jesus, the human Jesus, is vitally important to my own theology. If our bodies matter, if salvation takes place in our embodied lives, which is what the physical resurrection stories are saying, then all our varied bodies with their genders, sexuality, sizes and colors and shapes matter. While the historical Jesus was undoubtedly male, we are free to reimagine the risen one as female, as transgender, as intersex, as queer, as disabled, as Aboriginal, as a person seeking asylum held on Nauru, as a newborn baby taking her first breath, as an elderly man with COVID-19 who is struggling to breathe. In preaching and liturgy, I have used Rita Nakashima Brock's naming of the Risen One as Krista Community. I've used this as a way of communicating this understanding of Christ beyond gender and beyond the historical Jesus. Brock uses Krista to move our theological imagination beyond Jesus, however much it may and should draw on his inspiration and his teachings. In combining Krista with community, she shifts the focus of salvation away from heroic individuals, male or female, to show that saving power is located in connectedness. In naming resurrection as Krista community, we open ourselves to the risen one who lives now in the community that bears the name of Jesus. Krista community is risen in us all, risen in our lives. Resurrection stories like the Emmaus story are told that we might go on in hope, accompanied by divine presence, connected in mutual community. In the Emmaus meal, the guest becomes the host, takes the bread, blesses it, breaks it, and gives it to them. and he is gone. And there they sit at the table with pieces of broken bread and with each other. And they knew that Jesus remained with them even though they could no longer see him. Were not our hearts burning within us when he opened the scriptures to us on the road, they said. That same hour, that late and dangerous hour, they got up and returned to Jerusalem. In the night, risking the dangerous road back to Jerusalem. They could not wait until the safety of morning. There are so many reasons so many rational reasons to avoid the risk of resurrection. But once they had known it, nothing could hold them back. Cleopas and Mary felt an urgent calling on which they would stake their lives to reconnect with the community in Jerusalem, to testify to resurrection. So here we are, nearly 2,000 years later, Jesus' people, 
left with pieces of broken bread and each other. In this time of pandemic, we cannot gather to celebrate and share in communion, but most of us have bread in our homes. Most of us have enough to sustain us. The beloved community shares the memory of bread broken and shared, even when we cannot gather together. So next time you eat bread, maybe with your lunch today, pause for a moment as you place it on your lips and tongue and savour it in your mouth and let it be communion. Remind yourself of what gives you life in body and in spirit. Bread broken and shared is material, it's real. And resurrection faith is not about wispy spirits or ethereal ghosts. It is material embodied faith. We eat, we drink, we feed, we forgive. We become who we are to be in community through a shared meal. Bread that nourishes our body, story and relationship that nourish our spirits. And so even though we cannot experience Holy Communion at present, we can remember it. Remember it in our bodies and in our hearts. And we can open ourselves to encounter divine presence who is never contained in church buildings. Over the past few weeks of isolation, Claire and I have had several wine and cheese gatherings with friends and family. Not in a way that risked being busted by the Victoria Police, but by Zoom. We have connected, raised a glass in greeting and communion, eaten some excellent cheese and talked and listened. These moments of communion are sustaining and encouraging. At times during the pandemic and what will come after, we may feel that night has fallen, that there is nothing that we can do. The problems are too overwhelming. There is poverty that will only worsen after the pandemic. There is racism against indigenous and migrant people. We look at strangers as potential bearers of a disease that can kill. But we also remember that the meals we have shared are not just for our comfort. They also enable us to persist in resistance to injustice, to cross boundaries of race and class and sexuality, religion and nationality, to encounter the other who is different, to care for the most vulnerable. Resistance and persistence are ways of living that the bread and the wine, framed by the stories of Jesus and his friends, can inspire in us today. So hear the invitation to join in the work of the Spirit. Hear the voice of Krista calling us to love the bodies of others who are different and calling us to love our own sometimes heartbroken, sometimes sick, sometimes disabled, vulnerable bodies. Hear the call of Jesus into a broken world that cries out for healing and for hope through forgiveness, justice and compassion. Hear the voice that after the crucifixion promises peace, inviting us to join her with companions who are also bearers of the Christ on the road to compassion and justice. Here we are with pieces of broken bread and each other. May we, like Mary and Cleopas, be filled with bread and filled with resurrection. Alleluia, amen. And we sing together, God turn our grieving into grace.
In prayer, we join in solidarity with other people and with the earth. Let us pray. Gracious God, we carry with us the stories of our fellow travelers who have experienced loss and heartbreak. We pray for friend and stranger alike. We offer our prayers for all who have been betrayed by family, friends, or trusted institutions. Hear our prayers for peace and restoration where trust and relationships have been broken. We offer our prayers for those who do not share in the bounty of the earth, who do not have enough, while others have so much more than enough. We pray for ourselves, for generous hearts and for open hands. We seek insight and wisdom to recognize the sacred in unexpected people and surprising places. May your divine love remind us that we are wounded healers even when weeping ourselves bearers of justice even when we are overwhelmed, witnesses of hope even when we are struggling. May our prayers stay with us in the season of resurrection and stir us to make our dreams real. In your many names we pray. Amen. Receive a blessing for the week that lies ahead of us until we meet again. For light still shines, illumining our days as we walk together. And in the walking, we remember and celebrate the miracle and wonder of life and the unfolding and surprising purposes of God at work within us and within our world. May divine presence guide our path. May Christ be known in bread broken and shared, and the Spirit touch our hearts in gentle gladness. And may the blessing of the sacred be with us and with all creation, this day and forevermore. Amen.